For our presentation, we will be focusing on Yamuna Krishnan. I will be focusing on the background information, Danny will be focusing on the first principle, which is a redox reaction, and Ted will be focusing on the second principle, which is photos excitation. Dr. Krishnan was born on May 25, 1974 in Chennai, India, and is a scientist in the field of bio nanotechnology. Over the years, she has done research in areas such as nucleic acid nanotechnology, structure and dynamics of nucleic acids, and cellular and subcellular technologies. Krishnan was able to apply DNA nanotechnology to live cell imaging. She co-founded SCL Labs in 2018, which is a biotech startup that focuses, focuses on the development of drugs that can mitigate the effects of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. Throughout her career, she has won several awards such as the Infosys Prize for Physical Sciences in 2017, the AVRA Young Scientist Award in 2014, and the Innovative Young Biotechnologist Award in 2007, and the Cells the 40 Under 40 in 2014, the SK, the SK Raghunathan Scholarship from 1995 to 1996, and etc. Krishnan has an extensive educational background. In 1993, she graduated from the University of Madras with a BSc in chemistry. She went on to attend the Women's Christian College in Chennai, India, and the Indian Institute of Science. From there, she obtained both her MS in chemical sciences in 1997 and PhD in organic chemistry in 2002. She then completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Cambridge from 2001 to 2005. After that, she joined the National Center for Biological Sciences, where she was a fellow from 2005 to 2009, a reader from 2009 to 2013, and an associate professor from 2013 to 2014. Since 2014, she has been a professor at the University of Chicago in the Chemistry Department. In addition to teaching, she is the Chief Science Officer for SEO Labs. Over the past decade, Dr. Krishnan and her team have dedicated themselves to the creation and application of DNA and nano devices. Such devices range in uses, the most basic being mapping spatial and temporal pH levels. In the diagram, we see three distinct mapping methods. The first uses small molecules. The main issue with this mapping method is that it provides no spatial information, meaning that we do not know the organelles in which we can find the small molecules. The second uses fluorescent proteins, whereas now we know where and which organelles these fluorescent proteins target, we do not know the chemical quantities um, that we're looking for. Dr. Krishnan solved this issue using a DNA reporter or a DNA nano device. Not only does this show the exact organelle that we are targeting, but it also highlights the chemical quantities that we are interested in. So what is a DNA nano device? Um, a DNA nano device, as defined by the doctor herself, is an organ targetable radiometric fluorescent reporter. What does this mean? So at the heart of a DNA nano device is a strand of DNA. The strain of DNA has two dyes on it. One dye is responsive to a particular chemical, pH level, or ion. This dye is also referred to as a sensing module, as seen in the diagram in red. It will either turn on or off in the, in the presence of a substance being measured. The other dye is of a known quantity. It is used as a reference to find the exact magnitude of a target substance. This dye is referred to as the normalizing module and can be seen in green in the diagram. As each dye is on a different strand of DNA, both strands of DNA must be hybridized to form one cohesive double helix. There is an exact one-to-one -one stoichiometric ratio between the sensing modules and the normalizing modules, meaning that for every red dye, there will be exactly one green dye. How does this work? So first, the strand of DNA must enter the organelle of interest via a shuttle protein, as seen in light blue. I will be focusing on endosomes. These are organelles that sort and regulate components of the endocytic pathway. Once inside the organelle, there are two images that are taken. The first corresponds to normalizing dye, while the second corresponds to substance-sensitive dye. The pixels of the images are then combined to give a distinct dye color according to the magnitude of the substance. Ted will discuss this later on. In the diagram, we see the red dye and the green dye. 
the red being the substance sensitive dye and the green being the normalizing dye. And then in the third column, we see the two pixels that are overlapped and the different dyes that this produces. The result of the DNA reporter is an image made from the combination of chemical, spatial, and quantitative data. This allows us to measure the magnitude of the chemical of interest. Now that we know what this DNA in our device is and what it does, I'm going to discuss its application to enzymatic research. Dr. Krishnan created a DNA nano device to determine levels of enzymatic activities in enzymes. Hitching a ride from an endocytic ligand, the DNA nano device enters an endosome with the aim to quantify levels of disulfide reduction within the organelle. So why would Dr. Krishnan even want to study this? Well, enzymes, especially in endosomes, are crucial to the letting in and taking out and digesting of substances within a cell. Without functioning enzymes within the endosome, we find a variety of different health consequences. Redox reactions are the key to determining such levels of enzymatic activity. So what is a redox reaction? Redox reactions are a specific type of reaction in which electrons are transferred from one substance to another. If a substance loses electrons, it is oxidized and is said to be the reducing agent. If a substance gains electrons, it is reduced. This is, it is said to be the oxidizing agent. On the bottom right hand corner, we will see in blue and red an abbreviation that I use to memorize this. Leo the lion goes grr. Leo stands for lose electrons oxidized, whereas grr stands for gains electrons reduced. Using this abbreviation, we can apply it to the given chemical reaction. Magnesium, as it becomes goes from a zero oxidation state to a plus two oxidation state is oxidized. Whereas oxygen, as it goes from a zero oxidation state to a negative two oxidation state is reduced. So what is this oxidation state I'm talking about? The oxidation state of a substance is used to determine whether it is oxidized or reduced, as we just did. This is the number of charge that a substance would have if all shared electrons were assigned to the more electroatom, negative atom. Excuse me. However, if there are two atoms of share, the same electronegativity, electrons are shared. For example, we have peroxides and disulfides. Keep this in mind for the next slide. The sensing module, or the dye responsive to, in this case, disulfide reduction, is made up of one molecule. This molecule is the reactant. One part of the molecule, the part containing the thioperidyl group, via a disulfide bond, allows the dye to fluoresce. However, a carbon linker, as we see on the right in beige, prevents it from doing so. It cages in the thioperidyl group. Only through disulfide reduction, a type of redox reaction, can this dye turn on. In this redox reaction, we have the thioperidyl group being reduced. It goes from a negative one oxidation state to a negative two oxidation state. And this is because the sulfurs share the electrons between them. They steal the electrons from carbons, however. In the redox reaction, we have the carbonate linker also being oxidized. The result of the redox reaction is the production of a dye of 520 nanometers in wavelength, as the carbonate linker that was once caging in the thioperidyl group can no longer do so. The normalizing dye, on the other hand, produces a wavelength of 590 nanometers. Based on the colored images of both dyes, as we can once again see in the diagram, one can determine which enzymes catalyze disulfide exchange. We see the uptakes in dye highlight the enzymes that are involved, and the different colors of dye allow different magnitudes to be quantized. Dr. Krishnan and her team, using DNA nano devices, found that both enzymes PDI and TRX1 do so. In addition to her spatial and temporal pH mapping, Dr. Krishnan and her team also used DNA nanotechnology to release caged bioactive molecules and further identify and locate photoactivated molecules. This research was used as a way to demonstrate various signaling processes within cells for different species. 
So how were Cage molecules released? In chemistry, there is an important concept known as the photoelectric effect, which is established and explained as photoiridation in Krishnan's research. Light particles are able to generally provide energy to electrons and photoeject them. Basically, there is a certain threshold that must be met for an electron to be fully excited. This is usually set by the ionization energy of the atom slash molecule that the electron comes from. The ionization energy is defined as the energy to remove the most loosely bound or highest energy electron from that atom slash molecule. If the ener ionization energy is met, that atom slash molecule will have the energy to release that electron. To continue, when that threshold is met, an electron is able to be fully excited and therefore completely release itself from the atom slash molecule. As represented by the image, the kinetic energy of an electron, which is the amount of energy of the electron after it is excited and removed from that atom slash molecule, is equal to the energy of the photon defined by Planck's constant times frequency minus the th threshold energy. The threshold energy is typically defined by work, which is the amount of energy required to liberate an electron from the surface. Therefore, we can represent photo excitation with the equation E equals HV minus W. Now, in regards to her research, Krishnan studies structural DNA nanotechnology and uses that to provide a lot of insight at a sub-microscopic scale in different species. Specifically, the DNA icosahedron which is a 20-phase polyhedron, is used to direct its contacts, which is polymers and small molecule payloads, to different signaling processes and biological pathways. So how is the DNA icosahedron able to do this? It is able to do this through photo excitation, continuing from the, which is continuing from the ideas that I've established previously. The DNA icosahedron contains SRPs, which are stimuli-responsive polymers, and they are targeted to specific cells. After the DNA icosahedron targets a specific cell, the molecules are able to be photoiridated, meaning that they are removed upon receiving a light stimulation. To be able to detect these excitations and targets, the molecules are tagged with fluorescent light. While non-fluorescent groups are photoiridated, the fluorescent tag molecules are left within the DNA icosahedron. This allows Krishnan to detect both groups of molecules, fluorescent tagged or not, and the location of those cage bioactive molecules. The bottom image of the two is helpful to better understand such molecular imaging and allows for Krishna to detect their movement. We can see for the movement of these photoiridated molecules, either the photo excited molecules are tagged and their movement is detected out of the DNA icosahedron, or the non photo excited molecules are tagged and the location of their molecules that remain in the DNA icosahedron are detected. For our summary, Dr. Krishnan generated a DNA nano device that allowed her to map chemical, spatial, and quantitative data for chemicals of interest. Alongside her team, she was able to measure target substances using dyes on hybrid DNA strands. The DNA strand, also known as the DNA reporter, enters the organelle of interest. Once inside, two chemical images are taken. These are then analyzed to determine the magnitude of a given chemical of interest. In endosomes, disulfide reduction a type of redox reaction, distinguishes levels of enzymatic activity. In the reaction looked over looked at prior, the thiopyridyl group is reduced, whereas the carbonate linker is oxidized. This allows for the sensing dye to turn on. By way of this process, Dr. Krishnan and her team discovered that enzymes PDI3 and TRX1 were responsible for catalyzing the disulfide exchange. Dr. Krishnan used her prior knowledge, knowledge in structural DNA nanotechnology in order to apply to different species at a sub-microscopic level. DNA icosahedron has the ability to guide their contents to various pathways and processes through photoexcitation. Dr. Krishnan was able to find where the caged bioactive molecules were located since some of the molecules were tagged with fluorescent light. Dr. Krishnan's work holds immense promise in the medical field, as it can be applied to help cure lysosomal storage disorders in the young, along with neurode neurodegenerative diseases in older individuals. There is no telling what else Dr. Krishnan's nanomachines will be able to accomplish or help discover in the future. And these are our references. <laughs>